really believe this is one of those studies that you need to go over periodically. You need to consistently have this foundation solidified in your life. But uh, this is a very short lesson. It's only, of course, my copy's all wrote up, but it's about this long. And But there's some things I'm going to cover in, that are not in your outline. Is that an echo? Oh, I thought I heard an echo. But anyhow, um, that I think are good. I was going to call it, uh, change the name just to make a point, because I'm going to share, I, got, I think I wrote down five different areas where um, if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, you're going to be confused biblically. And this is foundational stuff. But let's just start with the verse. It's not in, out, in your outline. Last week it was. It's really the foundational verse for the study, and that's First Th Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. This is a uh, very important verse. But it says this. It says, the desire of God expressed through the Apostle Paul, and it says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it expresses God's de desire, and it, it also defines us as three-part beings, spirit, soul, and body. Very important. And then uh, uh, and when it says sanctify, that means set apart. I'm going I'm to just give you some of the Greek words. The word sanctified, this is powerful. This is God's desire. He wants us holistically. That means our entire being, not just our spirit, not just our body, our soul, but our, but our body, we, uh, our, all of it to be sanctified holy. Sanctified means to separate from profane things. It's a, a, to separate from profane things. Holiness is sanctification. Uh, healing would, or our health would be walking in physical holiness sanctification from profane things. And this is what's fascinating. And I told you I was going to give you a new, new Greek mood tonight that I don't use a lot, but it's two times in this verse we'll see it. Sanctify, this is God's desire, spirit, soul, and body, to separate us from profane things. It's an aorist active optative mood. What's optative mood? That an optative mood is a Greek verb and expresses a desire or a wish. This is God's desire and wish. Isn't that powerful? Doesn't mean it's automatic. But it's his desire, it's his wish. And you know, and that's, that's big because the whole God controls everything independent of us is that dangerous doctrine that seeps into our thinking. Well, if God wants it done, then it'll just happen. There's a lot of things God desires that don't get done because we have to cooperate with him. All right, so that's, I pray the very God of peace, and that's so fascinating, he's the God of peace. We have peace with God now through Jesus. Sanctify you wholly. The word holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, means perfect or complete in all respects. The word, uh, uh, it, it, mean, it means whole, means complete in all parts, in no part wanting or lacking. It's of, of a body without blemish or defect. In no part wanting, lacking, or unsound. Nothing missing, nothing lacking. And the word preserved is tereo in Greek, and, and it means to guard, Figur figuratively to stay in the state in which one is. I've used that before. But once again, this is a optative mood, which means it's God's desire or it's, wi it's his wish. Isn't that awesome? I think that's a powerful uh, expression there. But, but that's God's desire, that our whole spirit, soul, and body. Now, if you're born again, your spirit is joined unto the Lord. You're completing Christ, etc., etc., but God desires what we are in the spirit to express itself through our soulish realm, our mind, our will, and our emotions, and then in, even into our body. That's God's desire. Amen. So this, this understanding is understanding that you're three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. I got five things written here uh, that, I, that the Lord has given me. As we go through the outline, I'm going to get on these five things. I'm going to show you how dangerous it is to not have a spirit, soul, and body understanding. Man, is it dangerous. Wow. And a lot of people don't. So they convolute these things. For example, as we get into it, the first verse we'll look at in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, or look, I'm going to major on that word, all things have become new. Now, if you just think, well, man, bless God, like we were talking earlier, you know, overweight, now I'm just going to... Be Accept Jesus in that perfect way. No, that's not how it works. The newness is in your born-again spirit. Now, those are things we know, but I'm going to show you some things in here uh, that this is part of rightly dividing the word. Rightly dividing the word is not wrongly rejecting any part of the word. A lot of people think that. They'll say stuff like, are you ready for this? 
that, or I shared this one, I think I shared it Sunday. There's a doctrine that teaches Paul preached the gospel. It was the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. And that's like Romans to Philemon to us. And then from Hebrews on would have been uh, to the Jew. And Peter preached to the Jews, Peter and John, etc. And that there were two separate gospels. Peter, Peter preached the gospel of the kingdom and Paul preached the gospel of grace. How many know that's dangerous? Super dangerous. There's other people teach that the words of Jesus, which were before the cross, he hadn't yet been crucified, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John it records the crucifixion, but most of his words were before the cross. So he was speaking to people under the old covenant. So people say, see, that was under the old covenant. So that doesn't apply to us. Wrong. What does Paul say? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome or healthy words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is proud, puffed up in the smoke of self-deception, knowing nothing. He's an expert at nothing. <laughs> he's under the control of his own mind. He goes on and talks about doting about questions, strifes of words. He's, he's literally a hip, hypnotized by his own mind. He majors on non-life-changing issues. I've seen a lot of that in my life. Even the Old Covenant. I love the Old Testament. But I, I interpret it in light of the New Covenant. It speaks to me. It speaks to you. Amen? But it has to be interpreted correctly. Rightly dividing the Word is not wrongly rejecting any part of the Word. That's my point. And that's what I want to emphasize. But we need to know where to apply it at. How many know we're not doing animal sacrifices anymore? At least I hope not. If anybody here is, we need to have a talk. <laughs> because we're not under that dispensation. Jesus, John chapter 1, verse 29, John looks at Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, Jesus was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. There's no more sacrifice for sin, Hebrews chapter 10 tells us. Amen. It's, it was done once in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. So, but, but, but the types and the shadows under the Old Testament are really powerful. For example, the feast days. They all point to our relationship with God. For the first one, Passover, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, Christ is our Passover. So it's not a time of the year or a physical day. You know, th this is what Paul said in Galatians 4. You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you lest I bestowed labor upon you in vain. If you want to observe a day as to what it meant in that regard, but if you're observing it for righteousness like people do, how many times have I seen on Christian TV where it's Passover season, it's Pentecost season, it's, it's tabernacles, it's, you know, that stuff, that's nonsense. There's no holier time of the year than, than today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That was a prophecy of Jesus in Psalm 118, verse 24. Read verse 19 through 24. It's speaking of Jesus. What day is it? Doesn't matter. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're in that day. It's the day that Jesus brought about. Amen? Hallelujah. And when that day dawns in your heart and the day star arises, his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. That's all pointing to him. It's exciting. So praise the Lord. There's some powerful things. But let's, let's get into the outline and I'm going to show you five areas. There's more. But this is the, it'll be the danger of not being grounded in an understanding of spirit, soul, and body. I believe this is so, so foundational. So, so necessary. Every born-again believer has undergone a complete inner transformation. And here it is, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ. Now, let me stop here. Implying that every man's not in Christ, as some people teach. It's not independent of their choice to be in Christ. Paul talked in Romans 16, 7 about those who were in Christ before him. Amen. So when you're born again, now you're in Christ and Christ is in you if you're born again. So it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. This is a brand new kind. He's a brand new kind of, of creation. It says, it says uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now let me stop here. I'll never forget years ago, listen to the Christian radio. Who remembers J. Vernon McGee? Yeah, I just looked him up because I wasn't sure what year he passed away. But it was 1988. I looked it up on my phone a little bit ago. He would be on the radio and he would talk like this. And the Bible says, 
And, 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 you know, I would have Christian radio, and I'd listen to him and stuff. And he was, I think he was a Presbyterian, but had some good things. And one time he was teaching. He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new. As soon as he said that, the Lord said he left something out. I said, what did he leave out? Behold. Behold. Now, he wasn't teaching bad. I'm not putting him down. I don't mean it like that. But I'm saying it I jumped at me, even back then. <laughs> It's like I was, some, something left, was left out. What was left out? So I looked at it. That's big. Behold, look, all things are new. That's big. We're going to get to that here in a minute. All things are become new. And then it goes on and says, And all things are of God in this state, who hath reconciled us to himself by God. And it goes on to say, Be reconciled to God. Uh, your body and soul didn't change when you were born again. The transformation of your body and soul will, won't be complete until you go to be with Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 speaks of the bodily resurrection. When we will get a brand new glorified body. This corruption shall put on incorruption. This mortal, which means death doomed, <laughs> body, shall put on immortality. You know, right now we are in these bodies. We take care of them. We do the best we can with them because it's all we got while we're here. James 2.26 says the body without the spirit is dead. So if your spirit leaves, your body's just going to fall <laughs> like an old shirt or something because this isn't your glorified body. And one more thing I'll throw out here, and this hopefully will help somebody. People get all hung up on cremation and all that kind of stuff. And I say, what if you get ate by a shark? Or you're blown up in an explosion? I'm serious. Or if, you, if your body's going to go back to the dust. This is not your body. And you read 1 Corinthians 15, he says, this is not the body you're going to be in. You're going to have a glorified body. Amen? So hopefully that helps someone. I know people get all hung up on it, and if you are, don't get cremated, okay? But that's not, you know, people say, well, I'm going to the grave, I'm doing this and all that. They're not there. You know, I've heard of Christians laying on old-time evangelist graves to try to get the anointing that was on them. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. You can open yourself up to something that ain't God. God's not there. Or they're not there. They're in heaven. If they're, you know, assuming they're born again. Amen? All right. So, a few freebies there. But it says, your soul and body didn't change when you were born again. The transformation of your body and soul will not be complete until you go to be with Jesus. There it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on in mortality. The change occurred in your born again spirit. That's where the change is at. That's why I think that word behold is so important. The word behold, and I looked it up here uh, in one of my things, just a short definition. Uh, it means to behold, which calls attention to that which follows. So when it says behold, it's calling attention to that which follows. What is which follows? The all things that have become new. The all things that have become new. Now, Watch this. It says, your spirit was instantly and completely transformed. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Very important verse. Colossians 2, verse 10. Watch this. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now it says we're complete in him. So many Christians are trying to do stuff to be complete because they don't understand who they are in the spirit rather than coming from a position of complete. Okay, now let me um, give you, let me jump, let me give you, now I'm debating where to go, whether to go here. Let me give you the first one, all right? Go to 2 Timothy 2. Paul had something written, written in here that I think is very important as you go to verse 15, very familiar verse, I mentioned it earlier. Paul had something written in here. Uh, that, that's uh, super important. I believe the New Testament, if you read the epistles, I believe there's two primary things that are being done. Number one, the epistles. Commu uh, teaching new covenant doctrine. Identity in Christ. Who we are in Christ. Number one. Number two, I, 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 this is what I see. Warning against erroneous teaching against who we've become in Christ. Air that will lead us away from that understanding of who we become in Christ, right? So, Paul, I'm just use, I'll use Paul. There's Peter, James, John, etc. But I, I'm just going to use Paul for a moment and say, primarily teaching who we've become in Christ, our identity in Christ. And number two, teaching against the deception that would try to rob us of who we've become in Christ by getting us to relate 
based on someone we're not. In other words, to relate to God based on I'm just an old sinner saved by grace or whatever. See, that's not understanding spirit, soul, and body. And I just heard someone recently, uh, they, were, they were talking about how, man, if Jesus came in, we would just know uh, how holy he is and how not holy we are and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, boy, that sounds real humble and good, but it's incorrect. If you're born again, see, if you're born again, man, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I say that with the utmost humility possible. That's not about me. That's about what he did for me. That's about the free gift of righteousness. But see, there's people think, oh, you're being cocky. You're being arrogant. Who do you think you are? Well, I'm who Jesus said I am. That's what humility says right there. That's what he's, I, I mean, blame him. <laughs> I'm just agreeing with him. Amen. You know, can two walk together except they be in agreement? Amos 3.3. 3. And, and when it says we confess him and we confess the promises and what he says we are that means we speak to the we speak in agreement that's simply what that means amen now watch here's the first one so second timothy chapter 2 verse 15 i'm just going to start here i'm going to show you one why it's important to understand spirit soul and body second timothy chapter 2 verse 15 study to show thyself approved a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth Rightly dividing the word of truth. How important is it to rightly divide the word of truth? Okay? But then it goes on to say, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. In other words, empty talk, it will increase unto more ungodliness. Air, it will create un, unrightly dividing the word. It will increase unto more ungodliness, is what it says. Now hang with me. And their word will eat as doth a canker, just like a gangrene. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. These were two heretics in the early church. It's going to eat just like gangrene. It's going to get worse, is what, what Paul's saying. And then it goes on to say, what did they teach? Here it is in verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Now stop. Spirit, soul, and body. Have you ever asked why Paul, why these guys were able to err saying the resurrection was past? Hang with me. Okay, go to Ephesians 2.6. Watch this. These are verses you know. These are verses you know. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. Watch this. Powerful revelation. I'll just start with verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened or made alive, he hath quickened us, together with Christ by grace you are saved. Watch this and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, one more, Colossians, same thing, and then I'm going to tell you what, something about those verbs. Verse 1 of Colossians 3, If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now it says, he's saying, if you be risen, and of course you are. But wait a minute. Paul said it, people were teaching the resurrection is past. Everybody say spirit, soul, and body. Our spiritual resurrection has taken place. But what Paul was addressing in 2 Timothy 2 was a bodily resurrection that 1 Corinthians 15 speaks of. See, if you take the word out of context, wait a minute, it says, it says we've been, and, and when it says in, in Ephesians 2, 6 and Colossians 3, 1 on down, when it says, you are risen, hath he raised in, uh, in for example, in Ephesians 2, 6, and the same verb tense is in, uh, in uh, Colossians 3, it's eris indicative. Eris indicative has time relations only when it's in that construction, it meaning past tense. What Paul's saying is that that resurrection is past. When did it happen? When Jesus was raised. Our spirit was raised and seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But how many know our body hasn't? So how, can, how could somebody err in saying the resurrection is past? To take you to those verses and say, see right there, it's past. So Paul had to address that. You see, here's my point. If you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, I'll give you another example. I won't go there. 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 5, verse 18, places, 
I'm going to paraphrase. If you sin, you're of the devil. Yeah. If you've ever sinned, anybody here, including me, we're all of the devil. He's not talking about... Our spirit doesn't produce sin. We don't stop trusting in Christ. I don't have time to get into that. I could go to Hebrews 10 and show you that. You know, so if you sin willfully after you receive the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which should devour the adversaries. And I could go on. Point being, how many know all sins willful? <laughs> At least that's why it's sin. Is that too deep? <laughs> he's talking about rejecting Christ as the sacrifice. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about stubbing your toe and cussing. But see, if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body back to the resurrection, what, and this is, I got a whole thing, and I'm, I'm just going to touch on this. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the second death. Revelation 2.11, Revelation 20, verse 6, Revelation 20.14, Revelation 21, verse 8. It talks about the second death and the first resurrection. Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that has part or takes his part. Miros in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. Now, I'm going to stop right there because I could talk more. But the first resurrection, what was the first death? Spiritual or physical? Spiritual. Genesis 2.17. God told Adam, in the day that you eat thereof, Hebrew, in dying you shall die. 930 years later, he physically died. But he died spiritually the moment they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the first death was spiritual. The second death is all the miseries arising from that sin, both here and hereafter. That's Romans 8, 6 from the Amplified Bible. That's what it is. So all the results of the first death, which is separation from God, result in the second death. And it says, Blessed and holy is he who takes his part in the first resurrection, that I've been raised and seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ. You know, problems look small when you look from a great height. If you look from the, your position in Christ, your problems look small. But if you look from an earthly perspective, they look pretty big. Can you say Goliath? <laughs> right? So Paul had to address that. But here's my point. We're not going to understand these things without understanding spirit, soul, and and body. Amen? We need to understand that. Here's another example. Go to Ephesians 5. I hope this helps you because it sure helps me. I'm the type of person I just have to understand. In the words of Tom Petty, I need to know. Although he wasn't singing about the word. All right. It says in verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now stop. I thought I was complete in Christ, Chris. You just said that in Colossians 2.10 that you're complete in Christ. You are in your spirit. But here he's telling us in the Greek, present tense, passive voice, which means we receive it, continuously receive it, and it's imperative. It's a commandment. To be filled, constantly filled with the spirit. What part of me needs to be filled? Soulish realm. My mind, my will, my emotions, and that will affect my body. You ever wonder why it's called the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23? You ever meditate on that? It's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I know people think it is. It's not. You can't tell. Spirit is pneuma in Greek. And you have to look at the context. How do I know it's not the Holy Spirit? Are you ready? It says one of the fruits, a fruit, it's singular fruit, nine attributes, singular fruit is love. The Holy Spirit doesn't have love. He is love. God is love. He is God. 1 John 4, 8 and verse 16 says, God is love. A fruit of the Spirit, my born-again Spirit, a fruit, a byproduct of my relationship with the Spirit of God is love, is joy, is peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith or faithfulness, meekness and temperance or self-control. Against such... There is no law. You don't need an external standard if you're operating from the inside out. Amen. It's powerful. But see, here it says in Ephesians 5.18 that I'm supposed to be filled with the Spirit. So what part? My spirit doesn't need to be filled. Right? 1 Corinthians 6.17 says, He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So it's not my spirit that needs more of God. It's my soulish realm which affects my body. Isn't that powerful? But see, if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, you're out there looking for stuff you've already got in your spirit. 
That's why he said, back to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Behold! Look! <laughs> now here's another behold that's related to that behold. Derivative of that. Or go to 1 John 3. 1 John chapter 3 and look at verse 1. It says, Behold! 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 Look! Behold! Look! What manner, what kind of love the Father hath bestowed upon us what should we be looking at? The kind of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. And it's not gender specific. It's talking about family. Now stop. That's amazing. He's saying, look at this kind of love that God calls us family. Pretty heavy. And then it says, therefore the world knoweth us not because it did not know him. The world doesn't recognize, yeah, son of God, daughter of God, whatever. They can't recognize that, so it's, but it's not based on us. It's based on his love for us and the fact that we received it. And it says, look at this, beloved now, that's heavy, are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. We're not in our glorified bodies yet, but, but we know that when, we shall, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Every man that keeps their hope in him and his love for them, every man or woman that does that, it has a purifying effect on your life. That's what it says. I, I remember studying that. So, once again, the, if you don't understand spirit, soul, and body, then when, when you say, wait a minute, I can't be full of the spirit. I've already got the spirit. Right? But no, you can be. You know you can be unfull of the Spirit too. You know whatever your soul is full of, that's what spills out on other people. If I got a hot cup of coffee here and we're walking and we don't see each other and we come around the turn, how many know what's ever in my cup's going on you? Right? When you bump into believers or people in life, what's ever in their soul, that's what you're getting on you. Amen? If they got anger and bitterness, guess what you're going to experience? <laughs> Amen? But what's ever in your soulish realm, that's what spills on other people. That's why he's saying being, be full of the Spirit of God. Be jam-packed full of the Spirit of God. Amen. All right. So, so that's why Paul said that about the resurrection. That's what he said about uh, being full of the Spirit. Uh, I'm going to give you another one. Are you ready? Go to Deuteronomy 11. Now this I'm going to credit my friend Grant Fraley. Grant, if you're watching or going to watch, thank you. But I'm about done giving you credit because pretty soon it's going to be God told me. <laughs> God did tell me. He told me through Grant. But this is a powerful revelation. And I'm, I'm probably going to do this Sunday because I've just been meditating on it ever since God, you know, he shared this with me. Or he actually did it in a post a while back and then we talked about it. But uh, Grant's a wonderful preacher. If you haven't heard of him, check him out. It's in, in Deuteronomy 11, 21. This, look at this. That your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven on the earth. Now, don't look. Look up here. Now, this is an Old Testament verse, but it points to a New Testament reality. It was real under the Old Covenant. It's real under the New. This is a New Covenant reality. When people think of days of heaven on earth, I'm not going to ask you all what you think. I'll just give you some examples of what people think, okay? At least in our culture. People think days of heaven on earth are, you know, kicking back, laying back. And there's, that has its place. I mean, you, there's a time to relax. I get that. Or, or just, you know, just man living in a mansion, whatever. That's what people think it is. How many know when Paul was in prison and him and Silas were praising the Lord just after they got beat? I imagine there was a cut or two. How many know they we're experiencing days of heaven on earth. How many know when Paul was in prison in Philippians and he said in 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, just in case you missed it, rejoice. That's amazing. Rejoice in the Lord. How many would agree that's days of heaven on earth? Now here it is. In Deuteronomy 11, once again, spirit, soul, and body. In the new covenant, what do we have? We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. That should affect every area of our life. I agree with that. But even if it doesn't, man, it's not manifesting out here to other people, it's manifesting in here to me. Does that make any sense? Now look at Deuteronomy. Let's, what are days of heaven on earth? Look at verse 18. Therefore shall you lay up, these, up 
these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall teach them. This is talking about the word of God. You shall teach them your children, speaking in them when you sit down in your house and when you walk us by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall write them upon the doorpost of your house and upon thy gates. In other words, you're going to be wrapped up in the word of God. That your days may be multiplied. Here's the result. And the days of your children result in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as days of heaven on earth. What are days of heaven on earth? When the word of God's dwelling in you richly, Colossians 3.16. Days of heaven on earth. It don't get any better than that. Amen? You know what people do sometimes? It's easy to sedate your fears which the, with the pleasures of this life. You know, if I just keep not thinking about it, if I just keep, it's, it's like when I used to sing and turn the radio up real loud, it was amazing how much I sounded like the record when it was cranking. Just like the record. You know, because you can't hear the cries of your heart. Amen? See, days of heaven on earth are being saturated in the Word of God, so it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter if I'm living here, if I'm on the crowded street in New York or whatever, but if, I'm, if I have a relationship with God, with the Word of God, I'm packed full of the Word of God, I'm constantly into the Word of God, I'm having a relationship with God at all times, days of heaven on earth. I think that's awesome. But see, if we don't understand that, if we just base it on physical things, that's why Paul said, I go to Philippians chapter 3, I've learned whether I'm abounding, I've got a lot of stuff, or I'm abased, I don't have much. I've learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. That doesn't mean he was complacent, because he just talked in the same context. You met my needs, you helped support me financially. But he had, he, I mean, it was no matter what Paul was doing, he was prospering. Joseph, when he was on the slave block in G Genesis chapter 38, God said, and he was a prosperous man. Wow, <laughs> I look at that and think, you know, they, they stripped the slaves naked cause you, so you could see what you were getting. And God said he was prosperous. See, here's my point. We need to look at things the way God looks at them and not look at things the way the world, because it's so easy. This is like right now, I can't even, it's hard to get on social media and I'm informed about everything that's going on. And I'm trying to get away from some of it because it's everywhere, you know? But that's the, that's the enemy's idea, to overwhelm us with distractions. But heaven on earth is when you're consumed by the word of God. Believe me, you'll know what's going on. Amen. Praise God. All right, so that's another way. This is why it's dangerous to not have an understanding of spirit, soul, and body. Let me, let me finish this, and then I'm going I'm to give you a couple more examples. Everything you'll ever need in the Christian life is already pr present in the en entirety in your spirit. Every, I'm going to say that again, then I'm going to give you an example. Everything that you'll ever need in your Christian life is already present in its entirety in your spirit. Now, this goes in line as you go to 1 Corinthians 2. This goes in line with what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, right? And I used to think, wait a minute. Does that mean if you're believing God for a car, that there's a spirit car and it's going to be... Does anybody else think like this? That's, I do. I need answers. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that the ability for anything you need is already there in the Spirit. That's what God's saying. See, but if you don't understand that, uh, like if you're believing God for money, how, you know there's not money in heaven. I know people, streets of gold, I get all that. But it's not a, there's no need for currency in heaven. It's only here that we need it. Amen? But, if you, but yet you can believe God for that, Correct? But, but he, he's going to give you the ability. He's going to give you an idea. He's given your hands power to get wealth so his covenant would be established, Deuteronomy 8, 18. He said he didn't give you the power. He didn't give you wealth. He gave you the power to go get it. Hear the difference? Now watch this, but it's for the establishment of his kingdom. Boy, there's so many things to say, but watch this. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. The danger of not being grounded in an understanding of spirit, soul, and body is the point I'm after here. Look at verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now let's stop. I'm going to go on here, but I just want you to understand this is not talking about heaven when we get to heaven. We'll see that in a minute. But notice these things, this revelation doesn't come through your eyes, your physical eyes. 
It doesn't come through your physical ears. Amen? That the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, this word prepared is so fascinating. It means prepared. It means uh, hath prepared. It means drawn from the custom of sending on before kings on their journeys, persons to level the roads and make them passable. Isn't that amazing? God has prepared for your journey and my journey. And, and we're going to talk about how to access that as we read on here. It's powerful. It's so powerful. But he says, so, so, so he, he's prepared some things for us. But how do I access the things he's prepared for me? That's a great question. Go, go on. It says in a verse um, uh, 10, but God, but God, I love that, but, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. So once again, spirit, soul, and body. God does not speak to your head. He speaks to your heart, to where your spirit is located in your spiritual heart, your heart consisting of your spirit and your soul. He doesn't speak to your head. It'll register in your head, but it comes from your spirit, your heart, your inner man. Your spirit's in your heart, heart being your spirit and your soul. That's big, because people try to, you know, they're trying to hear God with their head. Doesn't work. Look at that, it says, it says, but God hath revealed them unto us. What has he revealed? The things that he has prepared for those who love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. Think about that. The things, look at that. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. That's why we're not interested in just information. We're interested in transformation. Any information that I don't respond to just becomes that information. Maybe good information. Amen. But that's a whole subject. Now, look at verse 12. Now we have received. Now we have received. Now we have received. Not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Watch this. That we might know. That we might know, not guess, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So we've got that ability to know the things that are freely given to us of God. But notice, it's the Spirit that reveals them unto us. Now I realize the King James has capital S, little s. I'm not, I could go into all that, but it's real simple. The Holy Spirit reveals it through your born again spirit. And we have the spirit. If you're born again and I'm born again, we have the capacity to know the things that are freely given, not earned, freely given to us of God. But we have to access them. We have to access them. We can't, you know, I, if I don't know what I have, I'm not going to access what I have. Right? You could have a million dollars in the bank and not know it. And guess what? It won't do you any good. Right? Right? So the Spirit, but it's through the Spirit. we got to get this. This is why I think the enemy, he loves religion. He, you know, I heard, uh, it was Dr. Jim Richards said something, that the, and I haven't verified it, but i just seen, seen it today where he talked about how the word religion and the world, are they come from the same word or the same term. I haven't verified it, but I thought that was fascinating. I thought it was fascinating because human religion deals with simply external behavior. Amen? God's Spirit deals with us from the inside out. That's what I'm saying. God, I think it's significant that He wants your whole spirit, soul, and body to be served blameless. I think, it, I think the sequence is important. Spirit, then soul, and affects the body. I've heard people say body, soul, spirit, and I don't say nothing usually. Unless I'm in a bad mood, then I rip their head off. Just kidding. <laughs> no. uh, but I think this, the order is very, very significant. I think it's significant when Paul says... What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit first, then I will sing with the understanding. You know, we need to pray before we pray. If we would pray before we pray, we would know how to pray. Good word. Good word. But so often we just pray. The example I use all the time, we're like the surfer on the beach trying to create a wave. Okay, I'm going to get this wave going, then I'm going to ride it. 
How's that working for you? We need to pray and get God's mind so we know how to pray. You know the word pray? I've studied it. It literally has to do with exchanging your desires for God's. When you commune with him, because even, even your desire, I mean, Jesus would ask people, what is it you're believing for? Duh, that I might see. <laughs> well, you know, where are people at? Only the Spirit of God knows. Amen? We need to pray before we pray, then we'll pray accurately. But I think the sequence is huge. But back to 1 Corinthians 2, look at this. Now we have received, I'm going to go to verse 12. Now we have received not the Spirit which is of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know, God desires that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now this is amazing. Which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And I've read some things where it says spiritual truths with spiritual revelation. I believe it's simple. I believe it's comparing spiritual truths from the word of God with the spiritual nature that is now capable of understanding those spiritual truths. Remember when Jesus said in John 16 verse 12, I have many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. See, we take that verse and we apply that to our dispensation, which is a period of time right now. It doesn't apply to us now. He's talking, he's, he, the next verse he says, but when he, the Holy Ghost has come, how many know he's come? He'll teach you all things and guide you into all truths, amen? He'll bring to remembrance what I, all those things. So when he said that, he was telling his disciples before the cross, I've got lots to say to you right now. I can't say it now because I've not been to the cross. The Holy Ghost has not been sent, but pretty soon... I'll be able to talk to you at a, at a more intimate level. Amen? What I do there? I just rightly divided the word because you read it in context and it tells you exactly what he's saying. Amen? Praise God. I'm, I was going to get on circumcision, but I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> How many of you know it's circumcision of the heart? That's what he's talking about when you're born again. All right. Look at this. It says, which things also we speak. Now, this is for the purpose of knowing the things that are freely given to us of God. Remember that eye hath not seen, ear has not heard. It hasn't entered into the physical senses, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And I told you that that, that word was, uh, hath prepared, was drawn from the custom of sending on before kings. How many know we're kings and priests? On their journeys... Uh, uh, persons to level the roads and make them passable. How many know that God is showing us a process that we can operate from the Spirit and send forth angelic beings or people that He's using to level the roads so they're passable in our future? Amen. You know, God sees the future. He's outside of time. But we don't. But isn't it interesting? So he wants us to know the things that are freely given to us of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. What is he talking about? There's only one thing he could be talking about. That's a prayer language that the Holy Spirit has given you and I. That is awesome. That is awesome. And by doing this, we're praying into our future. We're releasing... Uh, Angels are people that are designed to level the road, to move out the obstruction so we can pass when that time comes. Amen. Now watch this. Verse 14. But the natural man, the sense-led man, the carnal man, the man who's not operating from the Spirit. Watch this. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. Now let me say something. This can be a Christian. Can Christians operate carnally? Read the next chapter. The Corinthians were a perfect example of that. Envy, strife, division, all that stuff going on. And the Amplified Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 or 2, right around there, it says you're operating like mere unchanged men. And Paul was rebuking them. See, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. Spirit, soul, and body. Where are the blessings of God? They're in the Spirit. They want to manifest in my, or they want to, be real in my soul and manifest in my experience. Amen? Look at that. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? They are foolishness to him. Moronic to him. 
Neither can he know them. Watch this. For they are spiritually discerned. Anacrino. You'll see that word here in a minute because it's in verse 15 twice. They are spiritually judged. Why doesn't the natural man receive the things of the Spirit of God? Because they are spiritually discerned. Through the Word of God. Amen. Amen. That's why we, as believers, Paul said, and I'm not going to go there, I mentioned it many times, but in Romans chapter 1, verse 9, he thanked God who he served with his spirit. You know why Paul didn't burn out? Because he was serving God from the power source where the Holy Spirit lived, his born-again spirit. Amen? Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, For this cause we bow our knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to his spirit to be strengthened with might, with might. How are we strengthened? With might, by his spirit in the inner man. It literally means we're invigorated. We're filled with energy by his spirit in the inner man. Have you ever noticed that people... Uh, you know, you've been around long enough. All of us have been around at least a few weeks. We've see, you see people, they're all excited, and then they're not. The honeymoon period's over. They got this new. They got this, per, you know, whatever it is, and it wears out. Why? They're not operating from their spirit. The Bible says in Romans 6 and Romans 7, we're to walk in and serve in the newness of spirit. That's the freshness. That's a, what does that mean? That means we operate from spirit, affects our soul. We've filled in the soul, and then it affects our body. Spirit, soul, and body. How important is spirit, soul, and body? Pretty important. <laughs> I think if this foundation is not so solidified in your life, you know, the things we think we know, we'll let them go. We, that's why he says, give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard, lest at any time you let them slip. But notice it says, but the natural man, the sense-led man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness under him, unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth, that's the same Greek word that's for discern in verse 14, in verse 15, it's the same word. It means to perceive, to discern, to investigate, etc. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. I used, this used to bug me, this verse. And I thought, wait a minute, what do you mean? He's not, everybody judges everybody. He's talking about accurate judgment. He's talking about the only way you can judge from the spirit. That's how you judge and discern. Amen? But he that is spiritual is able to discern all things, yet someone who is not spiritual cannot accurately discern. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And this is so big, but we have the mind of Christ. Just because you have it doesn't mean you're depending on it. I'm saying the same to me too. Amen? This is why we have to understand spirit, soul, and body. How many times we go like, man, I'm just, wow, I'm just feeling this way, I'm feeling that way. Well, what is that? Now, I'm not saying our physical bodies need rest. I get all that. But guess what? Even when you're tired, your spirit man's leaping for joy. He's full of excitement. He's full of peace. He's full of all these things that are there. All these things we think we know. And he want, that's why it's called the fruit of the spirit and not a work of the flesh. <laughs> he tells you in verses 19 through 21 of Galatians 5 what the works of the flesh are, and they're not good. But the fruit of the spirit, the byproduct, of my spirit man, empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. Love. First of all, understanding his love for me. It's joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's peace. Long-suffering. It's gentleness. It's goodness. It's meekness, humility. It's self-control. It's all these things. Those are all reality in my born-again spirit. Powerful. We have to learn how to operate this way. And he tells you right here in 1 Corinthians 2. <laughs> He says that you haven't received the spirit of the world, but you see the spirit of God, so you can know the things that are freely given to you of God, which things also you speak. You know, I got to tell on myself here, as much as I know this, sometimes it's a fight. And seeing the devil wants you to think, bless God, don't sit there and pray. Oh, don't pray an hour. You're, you're legalistic. You're only legalistic when you think that your righteousness is based upon what you do. Discipline is not legalism. If I'm training to run and I decide, hey, we got to run five miles today, that's not legalism, it's discipline. 
See, the, uh, there is massive confusion in this area. I listened to a, uh, a guy recently, and he was saying, the biggest problem in the body of Christ is we do not define our terms. We say things and we don't define, what, we don't tell people what we're meaning. We assume they do. No. Amen? And we need to define our terms. So the devil wants you to believe, well, you're under grace. Anytime you do things, you know, who has a Bible reading plan? Anybody in here read the Bible through, through a year? I do. I make sure I do because I keep seeing every part. Nobody? I don't know. I thought everyone did. Okay, Jen does. How many know that's not legalism? The only thing that makes legalism legalism is when I do something and say, now I'm right with God because I read my Bible. That's legalism. You know, the Bible tells us, let me show you, go to, go to Hebrews chapter 4. See, we're talking about operating from your spirit. Operating from your spirit. Setting your mind upon things above, things that are reality in your born-again spirit. But look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You all know this verse, but I want to show it to you in context. For the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, that's the heart, soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, that's awesome, right? Now back up one verse, the verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is alive and powerful. The word of God that's alive and powerful is the word of God that flows from rest. Now, it's all alive, but the word of God that's alive to you is a word that flows from his rest. And it says in that, are you ready? Let us labor. You know what that means? Exert effort. <laughs> and, and it contains the idea of being quick. Being quick. I mean, exerting effort, not wasting time, going for it. You know, if you look at the Apostle Paul's life, I'm talking about after his conversion. Man, that dude was legalistic. He wasn't legalistic. He was sold out. He was disciplined. He was fired up. So let us labor. You know what that tells me? We labor to enter, not to earn. Big difference. Big, big difference. We, Jesus earned it all. That's why he sat down, Hebrews 10, 12. So you know what I'm finding out about freedom? Are you ready? Here it is. Hang on. Hang on to your socks. I am free to be as intense as God created me to be. To be as disciplined and to spend as much time in the Word as I desire. You know what I'm experiencing? Days of heaven on earth. Days of heaven on earth. Does that mean there's no problems? Heaven, this, you can't be in this world. I've been studying what it means for the whole world to lie in evil, in, in wickedness. The lap of the evil one, however you want to translation you look at. I've been studying that. You know what it means? It means hardships, annoyances. all that. That's, that's the system we're in. That's the system we're in. And people try to sedate, you know, because the system's so, you know, so they try to sedate. But the answer is in the Word of God. It's a relationship with God. That's what we're looking for. And in the meantime, He'll bless. He doesn't care. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. He, God loves us. Amen? He doesn't care about that. We make stuff the, the thing, and stuff is not the thing. Jesus is everything. And he don't care about that. He, I think he would rather you drive a nice car than a car that you got to hold together with duct tape. Amen? I, but it's, it's a heart situation. It's a heart condition. It's understanding that you're already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That no matter what your situation, whether you're being sold on a slave block, you are still a prosperous man or woman. Or whether you've got a lot, you're still a prosperous man or woman because it's the condition of your heart. I've often wondered why some of these big people in power and stuff, and I'm thinking, how much do they need? How much power do they want? I mean, if the eyes of man are never satisfied. You know why? Because they're trying to fulfill, fulfill a God-shaped void that they cannot fill with anything out here. Nothing. It's useless. This is why we need to understand spirit, soul, and body. Let's go. Let me, your spirit is right now as perfect, mature, and as complete as Jesus. Let me show you another one. Go to 
Philippians chapter 4. And then this, why I call this the danger of not understanding spirit, soul, and body. Wow, time flew. We are landing the plane. We really are. I know you think I'm just saying that, but I heard that. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. Those, Paul said in Philippians 4, 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Wait a minute. I thought he would never leave me nor forsake me. Well, keep reading. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. If you don't get there, I'll just read it to you because I'm going to land. This is Paul, and he's talking in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in our physical body, we are absent from the Lord. I'm like, what? What's up with that? Hebrews 13 says, he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. He's always with me. And here Paul's saying these things like we're absent from the Lord or if you, if you imitate me and do these things, God will be with you. What is he saying? Spirit, soul, and body. Amen? How many know he's always with you? In your born again spirit, he'll never, ever leave you, right? He can't. That's who he is. In fact, Jeremiah 23, 24 says he fills heaven and earth. Even in the Old Testament, David said, if I make my bed in hell, you're still there. So what's going on here? Once again, I'm with him in my spirit. But there's times that I get so distracted by other things, I'm not with him in my thinking and in my soulish realm, right? Right? But he says, Paul said, if you'll imitate me in these things, God will be with you. But he's always with you. Once again, spirit, soul, and body. When you see these things, just like being saved, so many times we say, well, that person got saved. And we just think that means they got born again and they're going to heaven and now they're not going to hell. And that's, that can be, but that's very limited. If you receive a healing, you just got saved physically. If you receive uh, an emotional deliverance from a negative emotion, that's emotional salvation. The word salvation, soteria, the noun, and sozo, the verb, is, is big. It means deliverance in every area. Amen. See, so God's desire is that our whole spirit and soul and body are preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. One more quick one. Quick one. I was 2 Corinthians 4. You should be close. I think I am. It says, yeah, right here. He's talking about his light affliction in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 4. And in verse 18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Now watch this. How can I look at things which are not seen? My spirit. Who I am in Christ. For the things which are seen are temporal or temporary. They're subject to change. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So Paul said, I am focused on what I can't see. He wasn't denying what he could see because you can read that in the context because he talked about, he calls them their light affliction. But in perspective, I th I've been thinking a lot about Romans 8, 18. For I reckon, logizomai in Greek, logizomai, it means I account, that the long, or excuse me, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Amen? But spirit, soul, and body. Here's the thing we got to do. Look. Behold, all things have become new. That's in my spirit. And the more we see it in our spirit, the more we'll see it in our soul, and the more we'll experience it in our body. But it, it, it starts. See, so many people are looking in the wrong mirror. They're looking to the mirror of someone else's opinion to determine their worth. They're looking to the mirror of what the doctor said. I'm not against doctors for their diagnosis. They're not looking in the right mirror. And the mirror is the word of the living God. 2 Corinthians 3.18 and James chapter 1, verse 25 on down talks about. We look into the mirror of God's word. That's where we see. That's where we see who we are in the spirit. Is last week's message was God's mirror. And that was powerful. Praise God. So look, behold, all things have become new. How do you do that? You look in the mirror of God's word. You declare what God says about you. Amen. Father, I just pray right now for those that are here and those that are watching online. We speak the blessing of God over you. We thank you for joining in. We just decree that we would take this word, that it would settle in our heart, and we would continue to look at who God says we are as revealed in his word. We thank you, Father. We love you. We receive healing in our emotional realm, in our physical realm, and we receive that because that's a reality in our spirit, and we just take hold of it in Jesus' name.